right now with Joe Kent, of course, with Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, our regular weekly uh, conversation. And Joe, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Rick. Welcome. Good to see you. Yeah, great. And, you know, I was just on Maui yesterday, earlier this week, and um, visiting my old hometown where Mm -hmm. I worked and um, have many friends. I wanted to check on them to make sure they were okay. And um, it it was heartbreaking to see, you know, first just the visual of the town that isn't there anymore, but second, hearing their stories and and listening to a lot of uh, the survivors um, relay in in sort of slow motion what steps they took to escape the flames and and uh, so it was a really interesting experience. We're going to have a chat about uh, some of your experiences and some of the issues that are, are rising to top of mind. Before we do, please remind us the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii mission and how we can connect. Sure. The Grassroot Institute is a think tank that educates about individual liberty, economic freedom, and accountable government. We don't take any money from the government um, or unions or um, political parties, and that allows us to be independent. And uh, so we try to bring smart thinking, and there's a lot of smart thinking that's needed at this time. Well, let's focus. Uh, Over the course of a week plus now, We've been treated to statements and comments, et cetera, from our state leaders and city county leaders as well. There are a couple things that have emerged. One, the governor had intimated that he is going to do what he can to prevent predatory real estate speculators and acquirers, if you will, and prevent those home sales in Lahaina. First of all, is that accurate? Second of all, your retort. Yes, that's right. I mean, um, we're hearing that there are predators who are calling the citizens of Lahaina, um, landowners there, and um, maybe getting them to sign things that they didn't mean to sign and sign away their, their property rights and and absolutely, uh, the governor and the government should do everything it can to warn people about that and make sure that the uh, lands of Lahaina go to the wishes of the Lahaina's people um, and um, not scammed away. And so that's a really important aspect. Um, and But at the same time, he's... Um, the solution that he has um, dreamed up is to ban the sale of property in Lahaina that has been damaged um, to outsiders. And so we don't know what that means. You know, these are just off-the-cuff statements that we're hearing in press conferences and when they stick a camera in his face. And But today or tomorrow, he's expected to issue an emergency proclamation that actually details what that means. And so I'm, I don't want to be too hasty to criticize uh, the, uh, a policy that I don't know exactly the details of. But if the policy um, prevents people in Lahaina from selling their property forever to um, outsiders or anyone, that could really hurt them because, you know, this is the last asset that they have, the piece of land, perhaps. Let's say they escaped from the flames, they lost their car, they may have lost loved ones, they lost their home, and now they, the only thing they have left is this piece of land. And now if the government um, tinkers with what you can do on that land, it could lower the value sometimes to zero. If They say you can't sell it, and so... Um, And then if the government um, deems itself as the last um, buyer of all of these properties, which um, I know the uh, governor and other officials have made statements that, oh, the state should should own all these lands, um, that's not 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 necessarily a a good thing. And so I want the prop. I think this should all be up to the property owners, whoever the new the the property owners are. their wishes for their own land are the best use of that land. And we should absolutely warn them about any scams, insurance scams too. I mean, don't sign anything. You know, if you, if you are in that area, call your lawyer, 
Um, make sure that you don't uh, pick up the phone and sign away any kind of property right, even if someone's offering you money or something. Um, so be careful, but um, but also the government needs to be careful not to trample on individual rights. So would there be an inevitable uh, legal challenge if a particular homeowner, property owner, et cetera, both commercial and, and residential, was then thwarted from being able to move forward with a decision on their property? Um Absolutely, but it depends. Um, it, if the um, ban on property is goes overboard and violates the U.S. Commerce Clause of the Constitution, where you know we're supposed to be able to trade between the states, um, then it could absolutely face face a legal challenge. So, um, you know, the Attorney General and the Governor's team need to be careful about what they do. I know that it's a, a emotional time right now, but um, we, we need smart thinking at this time and, and not to trample on individual rights. What is your take on the fact that insurance claims are going to be obviously uh, plentiful but essential? Your thoughts? I um, think that, and I've talked to many around Lahaina uh, asking if homes there were insured. You know, did they, did people here generally have fire insurance and and the thought, most people tell me, yeah, most people did have fire insurance because the threat of fire was so high there. Um, so the insurance um, payouts for this are going to be huge. And um, I was talking to Joe Pluta, who was the, is the head of the West Maui Taxpayers Association. Um, and he, all, um, for years, has advocated for a fire station in West mm -hmm. Maui to which would bring down insurance premiums. You know, it, it would um, if you live within five miles of a fire station, your your insurance premiums sometimes can go down by half. And so he was gathering, you know, the future profits or savings of that and building the fire stations there privately, and then he would donate it to the government. And so he, he there are two fire stations there. He was built, wanting a third. Um, but he couldn't get the capital, and in the I, I think the insurance companies should have paid for it, you know, ahead of time. They would have saved a lot of money, but now they're going to be paying a lot of money, and and the people who are due claims, um, you know, there may be a way to get an advanced payment on your claim if you were just recently, um, you know, part of the disaster. But again, call your lawyer, <laughs> make sure that you're talking to the right person because you don't want to sign away any. Um, any rights. Another component of real estate is the exiting, if you will, from Maui. And first of all, has there been any indicator that the sentiment is now to leave the Valley Isle, perhaps to the mainland, perhaps to Oahu, but will there be an exodus, do you believe? I I think so. I mean, if you look at Lahaina, um, there's so much uh, toxic debris in that area. You can't build, e even if you wanted to, you can't, there's no way to build because even the infrastructure, the pipes are burst. It's going to take years to rebuild all that. And um, in the meantime, what are people who have lost their home and lost their job going to do? Uh, they're not going to live on a tent while they wait for permission to build that might come years later. And so this is a real question. I've been asking folks on the ground what they want to do. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's still too early to decide that. A lot of people are still picking up the pieces. Some people haven't even assessed the damage of their home yet because mm -hmm. they're not allowed in there. And um, But the general sense that I get, at least now, is that Lahaina is still alive in the hearts and minds of the people that live there. Um, Lahaina is the people, not the buildings. And and the people there live there um, for the community, and they want to remain as a part of that community, at least the folks that I'm talking to. Um, and so, so I think they're going to try to do everything they can to stay, but you can't, just can't deny that... The housing shortage was worse before, and now it's really bad. Yeah. We're talking with Joe Kent, Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. It's 848, Rick Amata program. There seems to be um, a, perhaps a perception of confusion. Tourists, please stay away because we need to take care. 
tourists, please come to Maui because we need your business. Mm -hmm. That's right. I I flew into Maui and um, saw, it was kind of like COVID. You see um, parked rental cars. There's so many rental cars that they have to park out on outside next to the runway, you know, and, and no one is renting cars there. No one is um, renting uh, hotel rooms. The beaches are clear. Um, and so on the one hand, you had that sort of euphoric feeling of like, wow, um, it's so nice to see what Hawaii looked like before tourism, you know, in the old days and when, when it was still virgin lands. But um, at the same time, look at all of the people on on the rest of Maui, not just West Maui, but the whole county is now struggling with the tourism depression. Um, tourists have canceled their trips and and what we're hearing from residents is please come back because um, yes, you guys, um, we all want to help West Maui as much as we can, but um, stopping tourism is it would actually hurt the rest of the county. If the government wants to rebuild um, the infrastructure that's needed, they're going to need tax dollars. And the county budget is based on tourism. I mean, it gets um, a lot of money from the transient accommodation taxes and, and the state gets general excise taxes. And, you know, this might take a billion dollar bite out of the state budget. It could take hundreds of millions of dollars from the county budget. They may have to cut back at a time when they need the money more than ever to help. And so tourists actually shouldn't feel bad about um, visiting. In fact, it may help the situation um, as long as they're respectful, though. I mean, think twice about that selfie that you take in front of the Lahaina sign okay. and so on. Listen, mm-hmm. I, I understand that. Mm-hmm. See, this is COVID again. You can come. We want you to come. Spend your money. Pay the highest rates. Do all of this. Most expensive vacation you're probably going to plan. But don't do this. Don't go here. Mm-hmm. Don't say this. Mm-hmm. Don't do... That is frustrating mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. tourists to try... Absolutely. Remember, it was, don't come to Hawaii. And didn't. 7,000 on average daily visitors to Maui, mm-hmm. down to approximately 1,200 and below. That gap is nuts. Yeah. I understand being conditional. I understand counseling. But if we're going to say the one thing, you got to expect... You cannot put constraints and the perception of that as being articulated by some of our leaders. Mm -hmm. I know that tourists will take that to heart. Well, and on West Maui, it's really complicated because on a Pali hotel is still there. It was not touched by the fire at all. Um, These are multi-million dollar hotel rooms that are gleaming next to the ocean, the beach. No one's on the beach, like I said. And I'm sure the hotel is desperately wanting, um, you know, more activity there. But it's right next to Lahaina, which is a major cleanup and disaster Mm -hmm. area. So that's a complicated um, thing for people. But... um, you know, all I my recommendation, all mm-hmm. I can do is make a recommendation of be respectful. Um, it's okay to visit, and and I think it actually helps the community. Um, but let's be respectful. It is uh, eight fifty two in the morning already on News Radio eight thirty KHVH. Now, some of the other things is not only um, the governor making statements about purchasing of properties. By the way, I just want to sidestep for a second. There's always a conversation about, oh, it's outside buyers, outside, but you're driving everything up, driving it all up. When, in fact, I had a conversation with um, Director of Budget and Fiscal Services and that it's at 87% of local ownership on Oahu, 13% oh, yes. of foreign. Yeah. So we, gotta, we have to kind of dissuade this. There's going to be a mad re- residents, citizens own the majority, vast majority. The other part has been about water. And Governor Green was very quick to point out why wasn't there this, that, and the other. Well, because we've had water rights issues for generations. The fact that we've had those issues unresolved for generations is one point. But what's your take on those statements by Governor? Well, we have had water fights on Maui, the the water wars, and 
the state um, la- a couple years ago um, passed a law or a- an administrative rule that prohibited taking too much water out of the rivers for use in the town. And so the local water companies, turns out there's all these private water companies on the west side of Maui, which is an odd feature of Hawaii. Uh, on Oahu, we're used to the county, mm-hmm. you know, running the water system. But on Maui, it's all these private companies and yeah. the county. And and so the uh, state also has jurisdiction over how much water they can take from the river. Right. Well, during the um, fire, the water ran out. Um, the county ran out of water. The only water left, I'm told, was at the West Maui Water Company's uh, hydrant. And all the water trucks were coming up, filling up and, and booking it to the fire to try to put it out. Well, at 9 a.m., they finally put the fire out, and um, but then it flared up again at 1 mm-hmm. p.m., and at that time, the water company used all its allotted water. So so basically, all of the companies in the county couldn't get any more water because of the state permission. So they begged the state, please mm-hmm. let us divert the water so we can put these fires out. And the state stalled and stalled until 6 p.m. when they finally gave permission. Well, I mean, as you know, by 6 p.m., most of the town... The main town, the front street, was was burned by then, right. and so um, now I'm told that the person in charge of that decision at the state water commission has um, been um, pay, placed on leave, and uh, so this is going to be another major investigation, along with the Hawaiian Electric uh, investigation. Oh my! We're going to come back in a moment. Final thoughts. Still need to run some business with uh, Joe Kent, who is with Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Fortuitously so, with us this morning, we'll return. We have remaining minutes with Joe Kent, Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Joe, I'll turn it over to you to wrap things up for us, but if you could just briefly address the sirens not sounding. Your thoughts? The um, government officials said that they didn't want to sound the sirens because it could confuse people. You know, people have been trained to run towards the the mountain and so on. But, I mean, on the government's website, it says that they um, use the sirens occasionally for wildfires. And so this this is the government trying to, um, you know, paint a picture that... um, alleviates the culpability on its own part and I understand that need um, listen I understand it's real it was a chaotic crazy situation but um, that's why we plan ahead for things like this and people have been warning about the the wildfires wasn't a random um, you know un uh, prepared for occurrence we could have prepared ahead for this and so that's part of the responsibility so um, I was talking to some people on the ground about who escaped and their harrowing stories, you know, pe- people jumping out windows, other people, you know, helping elderly who couldn't walk, escape the flames. And um, some people who had close friends uh, that ha- have died and passed away. So and now we're seeing the numbers go up and up. Um, I'm afraid to imagine how how high those numbers will go. We are entering into a very difficult time Mm -hmm. and i'm prayerful that we'll all be prepared speaking of preparation in just a few seconds the economic impact that we've discussed briefly is going to be further enhanced with time going by what are your thoughts about we what should we be aware of in the rebuilding process when it comes to timeline and revenue well, um, the main thing I'm talking about when, when it comes to timelines is the stages of grief. You know, there's shock, um, denial right now. Um, there's um, anger, and anger lasts the longest. And I think we're approaching that phase. And so there's going to be a lot of blame uh, in the next few years. I believe so. We'll pick up our conversation the next time we visit. Joe Kent, thank you so very much. Thanks so much. 